Yes. Okay? That's the answer to everything. Not 42, it's yes. So I'll just present some stats around Australian beer production and global beer production because there has been a sort of increasing trend down in total beer consumption around the world, which I think is terrible. Um, part of our research is focused on starch quality and the impact of starch quality on brewing. And then some new uh, technology that we're taking some of the beer research into is proteomics. And that's looking at an abundance of proteins from the barley right through to the final product. And a couple of problematic things that we're dealing with uh, in using proteomics to explore that. So here's the usual stats story we start our presentations with. So other than Africa and Asia, beer consumption around the world is either flatlined or actually dropping. And Australia is actually starting to drop. The growth market is China. And these, are, these stats are a few years old. But China now uh, is twice the beer consumption of America. And yet they're only drinking about 40 litres per head per annum. It's really just a volume uh, consideration there. There's just so many people drinking beer. In Australia, generally we're on, the, on a decline, certainly for regular, and now mid-strength has sort of dropped below that line. The only thing that's really holding Australian production up is the craft industry, and the crafties are sort of growing quite quickly. All the capital cities have, have craft breweries. And one of the reasons they're doing so well is actually provide something a little bit different in terms of beer quality or beer flavour. We're all used to drinking 4X or VB, uh, and you might want to drink a few of them at a time on a Saturday afternoon watching the footy. Uh, but if you want to go out and have a, a different experience of drinking beer, especially with dinner, uh, the craft beers really fit that, that window. In terms of beer production in Australia, all our beer is produced from Australian barley. And we actually punch above our weight in terms of production. We produce about 8 million tonnes of barley per annum. Uh, which actually puts us into the top 10 in world production uh, and top three for exports. So we don't, we don't actually use much of our own barley, we actually send most of it overseas. And of that 8 million tonnes, only about 30%, 30 to 40% actually get, meets that malting specification. That's a very tight specification. And it's interesting, the Australian brewers only use about 400,000 tonnes of barley to make all the beer and we produce about 17 million hectolitres. So we don't need a lot of malt to make a lot of beer. Uh, so the rest of it actually is either exported as barley and goes overseas to countries to make malt, or we make the malt here and export the malt overseas. Now there is a m significant difference between what the local malsters and brewers want compared to the overseas customers. And one of the main reasons is we're happy to use liquid cane sugar as a fermentable source rather than using solid starch adjuncts. So we use the malt from barley but then we add cane sugar and it's a readily fermentable source. So for the, really the big difference is in this starch area and in terms of fermentation. So fairly standard stuff, we know the starch is reduced to sugars uh, but we can actually get the starch from different sources. So in Australia we use barley malt and sucrose, but if you go to America, you'll, if you're drinking Budweiser, you'll be drinking beer that's made with rice starch. You go to Asia, you'll be drinking beer with corn or rice starch. So they get the extra fermentable sugars from this starch, other than the barley or wheat. All the sugars are converted to alcohol and CO2, and that's what we're interested in. But the brewing yeasts have very specific flavour profiles. The yeast really like small sugars and they really do like maltose. That's their preferred sugar. Which is very evolutionary convenient because starch reduced to two sugars is maltose and the yeast prefer that. So it's just been a nice evolutionary development. What's not fermented actually contributes to mouthfeel and flavour. Uh, and we'll talk a bit more about that. But for the local brewers, one of the things that they, they're concerned about is the fermentation can, out, can get out of control. It can get too hot, goes too fast, it goes too slow. And for these guys, where they're living by you know, a whole computerised system, if things finish early, they've got 60,000 litres of beer <laughs> that's ready when the next stage isn't ready. So it's very precise timing. So if things go too fast or too slow, 
this is an issue for them. So this fermentation is a big problem. And it's all happened if you've made home brew or even alcoholic ginger beer and you get tempted to put a bit more sugar in and then you cap it and then a week later at 3 o'clock in the morning things start to go pop, your fermentation's out of control because that's what's happening. You've got too much sugar. So part of our research is trying to understand where this excess of sugar is coming from and really what levels of sugars some of these brewers should be looking at. So through the talk I'm just going to throw in some interesting beer facts and beer trivia just to take the mind off uh, the, the biochemistry stuff. So some interesting developments throughout the world in history that are completely uh, a full contribution by the brewing industry. So pH was developed by Sorensen working at Carlsberg. Uh, refrigeration developed, some guy developed the thermometer working at a brewery uh, and all those sort of interesting stuff. What I find particularly interesting is this guy here, Gossett was working with this guy Pearson and we both know all about those. And there's an interesting question coming about gossip later. So in terms of starch, at the gene level, really a couple of genes making amylose, which is our straight chain, slightly more steps to make our branch polymer, amylopectin. This particular step here is interesting because one of these enzymes is actually used in making starch, but also survives the, the malting process and is then active in brewing as well. This is limit dextrinase. So I've, I've uh, modified a slide that Bob Gilbert has used many times and his poor students have used as well. Um, so here's our long chain amylose, our shorter chains are amylopectins, the amylose becomes a straight chain, very long chain, but starch branching enzyme will add a branch there occasionally, it's not, very, not many branches, whereas a amylopectin is heavily branched, it's a bit like a tree and actually measuring the size of these trees, the number of branches, is really how we determine the quality of this. These actually start to form these layers, these crystalline and amorphous layers, uh, which we can represent here, but this is what it really looks like here, these growth rings. And in the final grain, you have these large and small granules surrounded by a protein matrix. So this is really the, the stepwise development of these starch granules. And how the guys in the lab measure this using one of these technologies is actually uh, exclusion chromatography where they can uh, separate on size. So here's our amylopectin molecule and these are our amylose molecules. This is the size of the molecule and these are the length in glucose units. So they're actually quite large, can get up beyond 10,000 glucose units. Now we know the environment has a big impact on anything we, we grow. Um, and certainly impacts on barley. So this is just some samples we had a couple of years ago uh, from a high nitrogen and low nitrogen treatment. Uh, we can clearly see there's variation in the amylose expression here. And if we just look at that particular set from uh, Yellow Roy, it's a site in New South Wales, clearly there's difference in the size of these amylose molecules. Uh, so we, we, we know that amylose can actually be significantly impacted by environment. But we don't know what that means in terms of functionality. When you actually take that barley into the brew house, what does that mean? We really don't know yet. Here's another example. These are 60 odd barleys that have met the malting specification. So these are barleys that the malsters are actually going to make malt with and then send to the brewery. The interesting thing is that of these 60 odd barleys, all of them were similar protein so content and similar grain size and similar starch content. So structure is very different to the amount of starch we have. So we can measure starch content, how much starch is present, but it doesn't always tell us much about the structure of the starch. And this is where we've been missing this information between measuring how much starch we've got and we think, well, we know what that means in terms of functionality. When in reality, the structure is actually what's, what's going to control the final product. So to go from a five-fold difference here in the size of these amylose molecules was quite revealing to us and actually scared the crap out of the company that supplied the samples. Don't quote me on that. Um, so as I've mentioned before, starch is our key substrate for our fermentable sugars. During the malting process, which is a simple germination and drying process, there's little loss of starch. We're really trying to control uh, the the germination process, 
we want the cell walls to break down and we want the protein matrix to be degraded, but we want the starch more or less left intact. Once we've got our malt, we can actually use different mashing styles or brewing styles to get different fermentable sugar profiles. But the mashing style also can impact on the enzymes that degrade the starch. So it's not a straightforward exercise. We have to look at the starch itself. We know the enzymes in are gonna, that are going to degrade starch and then the potential of fermentable sugars. So our main starch degrading enzymes are alpha amylase, beta amylase and limit dextrinase. So alpha amylase is a fairly savage little beastie. He'll just get in there and cut these long chains randomly. Just gets in there and cut, 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 cut. It's quite thermal stable. He can survive up to about third, uh, 68 degrees. So he's, he's most active. Beta amylase is a fairly sensitive chap. Uh, he will only cleave off maltose from the end of a, a chain. And that's where a maltose comes from. Beta amylase just casually goes along chopping off maltose. But he's very sensitive to temperature. And above about 55 degrees, he, he's not happy. Limit dextrinase is the key enzyme in cleaving these 1,6 branches in the amylopectin structure. So the more he's active, then the more chains that are available for alpha amylase and beta amylase to act on. So in reality, he's probably one of the, the most important enzyme we need to, to think about. So there's our starch synthesis again. And there's limit dextrinase. So it actually is present when starch is being formed in the grain and it survives that process and then ends up in the brewing process. So a couple of different experiments we've done, we've looked at how these uh, starch structure and maltose ferment and fermentable sugars are produced in different styles. So these are an old terminology, congress and infusion. So the congress is really to make lager beers and it's a slow, low temperature ramp up to 65, up to 70 degrees. So Limit dextrinase and beta amylase have plenty of time to do their business in here. Uh, once it gets above about 65, they're pretty well cooked. When we're making ales, we're actually striking in at a very high temperature at about 65 degrees. So the only enzyme that's really active is alpha amylase. So the other two enzymes don't have much time to do their business. So alpha amylase actually becomes a pseudo limit dextrinase and beta amylase at the same time, because it will actually make maltose. So alpha amylase is our key enzyme. So just the process in itself, if people aren't familiar with it, this is this mashing process. This is the first stage of making beer. We actually take malt, mix it with hot water. Uh, we filter that. This is where we add hops in a boiling step where all the alpha acids, the, all the bittering components come out. Goes through a cooling process. We chuck in some yeast, let it ferment, and there you go. We've got some beer. So what we can do in our lab is actually make this uh, sort of first stage, this mashing process. So this sort of horrible looking liquid here, uh, molten water actually comes out looking this amber fluid here, which is the first stage of the beer production. So we've actually looked at the survival rate of some of these enzymes and we can, these are three different barley varieties and these, this green one is a domestic variety. These other two are export varieties. So this is one of these main differences between the export and domestic varieties. Uh, is this level of, of enzyme activity. This is a, a, an ale or an infusion mash. We're going in at 65 degrees and the activities of these, pretty well everything for beta amylase is stuffed pretty quickly. Whereas we have this soft mash profile, everything sort of enjoys it for a while, but then when we get up to about 65 degrees, again, everything is stuffed. Limit dextrinase is the surprise here, but that through uh, Bodan, it's an export variety, so clearly that's been why that variety has been selected as an export variety. It's got really high levels of limit dextrinase. When it comes to making sugar, uh, maltose is the key enzyme. Uh, it's a bit of a lag phase, but then it kicks in, uh, gets quite high, and when the temperatures start to rise again, it, the maltose drops off because pretty well all the enzymes are cooked. Uh, but even making the difference between an ale and a lager style, there's at least five times as much maltose in an ale than a lager. Uh, which is surprising, um, considering lagers are so sweet. So we've just used this process to look at, at the fermentable sugar profiles after uh, looking at the enzymes themselves. And this is some stuff that uh, Wen Wen's just finished a couple of weeks ago. Um, this is our starch structure. This is when it's, when it's debranched. Um, so this is our amylopectin. 
This is our amylose. After we've finished mashing, the amylose is virtually all gone, which is good. But we do have these de dextrin surviving. So these are these one six branches that are surviving. This is fairly new. We, we knew they survived, but now we can actually quantify how much of them is surviving. And we can contribute this to some other quality parameters. In particular, we talk about mouthfeel and flavour in beer. So this is where the mouthfeel is coming from, these particular dextrins here. We're really pleased all the amylose, amylase, sorry, amylose is gone, but that's a bit of a new result for us. So just in summary of the starch structure work, um, we can now quantify this variation in starch structure and actually put some numbers around how meaningful that will be to industry because at the moment any barley industry in the world will buy barley based on how big the grain is, how much protein is in that grain and basically test weight. Three pretty meaningless numbers. They don't, know, they don't measure how much starch and they certainly don't measure starch structure. So this potentially will give them information about, well, when they get their fermentations out of control and they have no idea why, we might better tell them, well, maybe look at your starch structure and, and if you've got a lot of short chains, then you've got too much available for the enzymes. It's just gonna, they're going to get stuck into it and chop up the starch and make too much sugar. Where if you've got lots of long chains, it takes them longer to do their business. So it's really the first uh, data to suggest that we know what's happening with some of these out-of-control fermentations. Unfortunately, at the moment, uh, I'm not quite sure how we do this, we can't pre-program starch structure in the barley as it's growing. So remember that set, that histogram where I had 63 barley samples, all within malt specs. Same grain size, same protein, starch structure was hugely variable. So this is a bit of an unknown for us, how we can, can sort of quantify that and get some control of that. But this work is ongoing. So, just to take a break from that, a little bit of trivia. Um, I'm glad I didn't live in ancient Babylon or was never a Viking. You have a read of those. A goat with beer in its udder. Anyway. I don't think I like beer in the morning. I'll take my coffee any day. Okay, moving on. So the proteomics work, and I see my two partners in crime. There's Ben over there and Ben's honor student, Ed, doing some amazing work with the proteomics. So the first bit is a bit we've done on foam quality. Uh, so foam quality really is a, a important visual quality parameter for anyone that, that that's, likes to have a, have a beer. Uh, you lose all that if you're drinking out of a stubby or a can. But those of us that like to drink out of a glass, a proper glass, uh, this is what we're looking for, this foam, although I think this is a bit excessive, uh, maybe a Belgian beer. Um, so we're really looking for that, not just the colour and the size of this foam, but really the bubbles there as well. It, it really is a, a science, trust me. There's a real science to this. But the other things we're looking at is also the flavour and the body in the beer, which was some of these sugars I was talking about before. Um, we know there's a number of things going into the good foam properties. One is proteins coming from the barley, some of the alpha acids coming from the hop, and we know yeast plays a role. There's yeast proteins that go through to the foam itself. But in Australia, there's little to no measurement on foam quality when they're developing or releasing new barley varieties. So these barley varieties are produced by commercial breeding companies. They go out in the industry, but the industry doesn't have the time or the capacity to measure foam quality until it's already in the brew house and they're suddenly getting crappy foam. Um, so they're sort of saying, well, is there a way we can test for that before it gets to the brew house? So the proteomics was used to identify what proteins are present, uh, put some characterisation around those functional groups, what are these protein groups, uh, and actually see how we can quantify those in terms of their correlation to foam structure or foam properties. So just using again one of these high temperature ale mashes, we're, we're really cooking the crap out of everything, um, sampling at what we would call sweet wort, so that's before we, we add the hops in the boil and after boiling before it's fermented. And the work identified 234 proteins, which was a bit of a surprise. Um, it was probably a few more than we thought, but it was the usual suspects that have been reported in the literature before. So storage proteins, 
lipid transfer proteins and a bunch of inhibitors. These are really small proteins that actually survive from barley into beer. And some yeast proteins, which wasn't surprising either. So this is a lovely heat map that Ben generates. Um, so we can see for a number of these there's little change between the process of going from sweet wort, boiled hop wort, into the final beer. We do see a significant increase in some yeast proteins coming here. So this is a lovely piece of technology now we can actually look at 200 plus proteins in a single profile and do some quantification around the numbers of these. So it really allows us to have a big picture look at some of these, these processes. Uh, this was a different beer sample itself <clears throat> but we can actually see the difference between what's in the beer and what's it when we sample the foam uh, and the usual suspects are some yeast proteins here these are our storage proteins, these hordines, uh, some inhibitors, lots of inhibitors. So they actually survive right through from barley into the brewing process and actually have a positive or sometimes negative contribution to beer foam. And there's our list of, of the usual suspects. Um, <clears throat> so a local company asked if we could troubleshoot on a particular issue they had and Ben used some proteomics to try and identify that troublesome product uh, and was able to do so. Uh, without the capacity to do proteomics, we were really shooting in the dark. We had no real idea what we could do with this uh, because we didn't know whether it was a protein source or a carbohydrate source for this, this problem. <coughs> so that was a lovely result and I think that work will continue. But just to see where this troublesome protein came from, we actually have taken some samples from a particular barley trial, uh, and these are some uh, particular disease nurseries, uh, and the particular protein is always expressed at a reasonably high level uh, and different between these untreated and treated proteins. So we know now where this troublesome protein is coming from, and it's one of those that just, it's a small protein, it's in barley, it survives the malting and brewing process, and it's just going to be there in the end. <laughs> so we can't take it out of the process and it potentially will always be a problem for the brewers. Something we've got to work with them on. Uh, so that work should be ongoing. Uh, and another area um, right at the very start of the whole malting and brewing process is when we're actually making malt is looking at the germination. So when we're actually making malt we actually put it in water, put barley in water, let it germinate then we dry it at fairly high temperatures to make, uh, well, really it's producing colour compounds as well as to remove water. Um, so in a commercial production system, if a malt company is malting a thousand tonnes of barley, ideally you'd want a thousand tonnes of that grain to germinate because if you don't, you've got dead or unviable grain in the system and that will cause problems later on. So they have a 2% limit on what won't germinate. So if you've got a thousand tonnes, they'll allow 998 tonnes to germinate. If it's less than that, they've got a problem. There are barleys that will inherently lose their germination over the season. So a season is actually 14 months. So we harvest in December, they're still malting that barley February, a year and a bit later. So this grain has to remain 100% viable for 14 months, which is a long period of time. For a number of barleys, at some point, they lose that 100% viability. It's unpredictable and unexplainable. So we're using proteomics to explore potentially which proteins may or may not be or, or functional proteins that are contributing to or a cause of, of that loss of germination. And again, a couple of usual suspects in here, these inhibitors, and some preliminary data suggests between 50 and, and at least 100 proteins that are changing in this process. So it allows us to, again to have a really broad look at lots of proteins. From these proteins we can go back to the gene level and look at gene expression and see what's actually happening in the barley. We can now take some barleys at harvest and track them through a, a whole 14 month period and see what's happening every month and if there's a potential biological protein marker to indicate things are going to get bad quickly for these molsters. And this is worth a lot of money for these guys. They pay $400 a tonne for barley. 
So if they're buying 100,000 tonnes of barley, to lose 2% is big dough. So it's, it's worth a lot of money to these guys. And as I said, we'll go really starting with the proteomics, but we're actually going then back to transcriptomics and then at to the gene level uh, through these omics platforms. Final bit of beer trivia. This would be a good job for you, Yasmina. So who knew student was working at Guinness Brewery? Gossart. He was working at Guinness Brewery and they're trying to match or see the difference between brewing batches. So they worked out a way they could actually compare two, two tests. And his boss was Gossart and he said he couldn't publish under his name. So he had to be published as student. That's not very nice, is it? So, <coughs> short and sweet, um, so partners in crime and coffee as well as Department of Ag people and UQ, uh, we probably now have the best capacity to do moulding and brewing research in Australia. Uh, and that actually goes from barley right through to finished beer products. Uh, we do have very strong relationships with industry and they're funding some of our research, which is great. Uh, we do like to get a few publications out, which we've done, more in the way. Hey, Ben. <laughs> um, so just in final acknowledgement, a um, couple of the companies that we're working with. Interestingly, this SAB Miller, uh, South African Breweries Miller, they used to own CUB. There's been some changes happening there. They're the second, they were the second largest beer company in the world, worth $80 billion. They've now been taken over by Anheuser-Busch, the largest beer company in the world. So we now have this AB monster, um, worth approximately $200 billion. And I'm going to talk to them next week <laughs> and see if they'll fund us. Uh, and some fantastic collaborations here with uh, not only just in Coffee, but Ben and Ed at School of Chem and Jennifer in SAFs. And of course, all our hardworking PhD. So uh, short and sweet, we can go and have lunch. Oh, look, it is lunchtime. So we can either go and have a beer with the students or we can be a bit more sophisticated. I know which one I'd rather have. There we go. Short and sweet.